I decided to move to Las Vegas during a dear friend's outrageous Elvis wedding. Since we were encouraged to come in costume, I have to admit some of the attendees looked more like Elvis than the actual impersonator officiant, but the entire ceremony was over-the-top fun. And then all of downtown was at our doorstep. After tiki drinks, live music, and late-night pizza, I realized there was this special freedom here in Las Vegas. It can harbor sadness, but it also provides a great deal of joy. Today on CityCast Las Vegas, we're talking to Eric Duran Valle, who recently wrote Tying and Untying the Knot for Desert Companion magazine. He's going to tell us about the history of our city as the wedding capital of the world, as well as a divorce destination. It's Monday, July 15th. I'm Sarah Lohman, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. You've actually officiated a wedding here in Las Vegas. What are some of the most outrageous weddings or like themes or like wedding adjacent ideas that you've seen available here in Vegas? Okay, so I actually made (laughs) us a list, a list here. Um, I I gave each category kind of a fun title. The first one is, do you want vows with that? Uh, Which is Uh the drive through wedding. (laughs) And yes. so the drive through wedding is one of the most notorious ways to get married in Vegas, but it is incredibly efficient. Depicted in hacks, as a matter of fact. Her oh, daughter gets married in a drive through wedding. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Caitlin Olson. The good thing about a lot of those a lot of those um drive through weddings is that they're very close to the courthouse, which in mm. all of these options, you ha- it's very important. And you know, the venues and all these like wedding planners, they let you know it's like you still have to pick up the license from the courthouse first. And that's what I tell people. That's key. Mm-hmm. People have asked me about this a lot who have wanted to have these last minute weddings on a whim here. I'm like, well, you have to still have the paperwork ready within the hours that the courthouse is open. That's is that the way you roll? Yeah. So um, it, it does have to be when the courthouse is open. You can drop off like after the um, ceremony is done, you can drop off the completed certificate anytime. But obviously, the license has to be gotten within their business hours. But, you know, they're open pretty late. But yeah, no, you can't just walk up to the the chapel and get married, at least legally. You You have to be prepared. So no, like, 3 a.m. drunken wedding. Yep. What else you got? So I like to call this next one, for the record, uh, which are the museum weddings. As we know, Vegas has many great museums. And Mm -hmm. a marriage is a pretty historic event in someone's life. So it deserves Mm -hmm. a venue that is commensurate to that occasion and so the two options i really like are you can get married at the mob museum which is a very classy place you know a bit of a macabre subject matter but i mean you know they have the frank sinatra music playing you know it's very vintage vegas i'm sure people theme it out to the 20s and 30s too yeah so that's actually what they lean into is that you can have the ceremony in the courtroom and then the reception can be done in the speakeasy. Cool. Which, you know, there's not a lot of museums that have speakeasies. If you would like a bit more of a grungy option or you're looking more for something a little less fancy than the mob museum, there is also the punk rock museum. They do weddings there as well. Just important that you need to bring your own officiant, which once again, okay. I'm available for. <laughs> You you would dare to go to the Punk Rock Museum. All right. What's category three of Wild Vegas Weddings? All right. So this category I call Your Love Has Got Me Sky High. Whoa. And yep. So as you can probably guess, this involves uh, getting married uh, from very high places or very extreme heights. And, you know, that kind of matches, you know, it's your wedding day. It's something very exciting. So you want to match the energy. So on the strip, you can get married at a private cabin on the high roller at the link. You know, the big oh, Ferris wheel. 45 minutes and under, I assume. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be a quick ceremony. But then, you know, the ceremony, a lot of people I've noticed this are opting for shorter ceremonies. So, yeah. I mean, that's actually honestly the perfect amount of time. Uh, the other one is at the top of the Eiffel Tower at the Paris Las oh. Vegas, which you know, very nice and very nice, spa- very nice spaces in there too. You know, it's very, very baroque, very Parisian kind of looks in there. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And, of course, you can get married at the top of the highest observation tower in the United States, the Strat, or as true locals call it, the Stratosphere. I don't care what rebranding they're doing, but it's the Stratosphere to me. All right. These all sound like pretty decent options. Why is it so easy to get married in Las Vegas? Well, this goes all the way back uh, to the Great Depression. And it's very similar uh, to our gambling history, the reason why Mm. gaming is legal in Nevada. And I do want to give a shout out to uh, Angela Moore. Um, She's a history professor at UNLV who helped me a lot with that Desert Companion article. In the early 1930s, you know, you had the temperance movement. And one thing that they were trying to do to curb what they uh, were so-called gin marriages, Mm. you know, as in like you get drunk and then you get married, was, you know, to do a blood test. And Mm. so Connecticut was one of the first states, I believe it was the first state, to pass one of those laws, which not only had a waiting period, but also a blood test, which when I first heard about these blood tests, I thought it's to make sure these people weren't related or something. Oh, I assumed it was like testing for alcohol levels. Uh, No, so it was actually checking for syphilis. What? For for STDs, because th- th- it's part of that whole grander part of the temperance movement um, was the idea that, you know, everyone should be living clean. And if you're going to want to get married, you know, it shouldn't mm-hmm. be hasty or, you know, with someone mm-hmm. who's carrying a venereal disease. And so it, it becomes very restrictive. And Nevada, you know, doesn't have much in terms of agriculture or other exports besides, you know, mining. So around the same time that they legalize gaming, they also make it a lot easier to get married. Here. Mm. Never passes a blood test, doesn't have a waiting period. Uh, you know, once you're ready to go, you're ready to go. Yeah. You know, to give some perspective on why the syphilis thing is so terrible, uh, even if you have syphilis and are treated for it and cured, much like COVID, you still carry the antibodies for the rest of your life. So you would always come up as testing positive for syphilis. So Vegas does away with these blood tests. It does away with a waiting period, too, correct? Yeah. And, you know, I remember when I first talked to, you know, when I was doing research for that article, I would have thought that it was the quickie marriage industry that preceded the divorce industry. Hmm. But in reality, it was the other way around. Whoa. So before Vegas was the biggest city in Nevada was Reno, right? Right. And Reno became known as a divorce mecca because, you know, people, for whatever reason, their marriage isn't working out and they just want a divorce. And the way Angela explained it to me, was that if you get married to someone and you find out like, oh, you know, this isn't so great, you can just separate yourself from them. Like, you don't have to do it legally, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you can just move somewhere else and, like, not interact with them anymore. The marriage police aren't going to be coming to your house and be like, where is everybody? The reason people would want to get divorced quickly was because they would want to get remarried quickly. Mm. because they had met someone new and they wanted to start a new life. And so they made it easy to get a divorce. And a lot of other states did and still do um, have really long waiting periods to get remarried after getting Mm -hmm. divorced. Yeah. And a little clarification on that. Like, I didn't realize that a no-fault divorce, which basically means that two people are incompatible, that wasn't signed into law until 1969. Ronald Reagan signed it in California. Um, But it wasn't legalized in New York State until 2010. Mm -hmm. So although Nevada did also didn't have a no-fault divorce for until after the 1960s, it still seemed to have just more options and was a little more lax and then a really short waiting period for that divorce. That was the big part, was the short Mm. waiting period. So initially, it was six months. And this this is back, you know, in the early 30s. So six months was still pretty short compared because you had to establish residency. Mm -hmm. So as long as you were a Nevada resident, you could get a divorce as quickly as possible. Oh, I've heard about this in South mm-hmm. Dakota, too. That was the this one state that predated Nevada as like a place that women would go and have residence uh, mm-hmm. and then be able to get a divorce. And then Nevada, which is a little more convenient to get to get to for most people, 
came next, but also they dropped their, they eventually dropped their waiting period to even less than six months. Yeah. So this is what was called the divorce trade war, <laughs> which is a. Whoa. Yeah. Which is, yeah, it was between Nevada, South Dakota, I believe Idaho, and also Mexico. And, you know, six months was seen, you know, as the standard. And, you know, Nevada was in pretty dire straits. And they were thinking, like, well, what do we do? And mm. then they passed a bill in the legislature to lower it from six months to six weeks. And oh. that was seen as so brazen, so short an amount of time that, like, they won, essentially. We are brazen here. I mean, a lot of people see this as like, oh, you drink, you gamble, you go visit a brothel, whatever, whatever. But then that trickles down, I've always felt, to rights for individuals, including a financially viable option for divorce during a time when there wasn't much of an option. Yeah. And I think especially, you know, some people may take umbrage with this, but it is kind of cool that they made divorce or the process of divorce seem almost fun. <laughs> Uh, you know, you had things like the divorce ranches. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell which, me more about those. Yeah. So these were the ones that really fascinated me, which is that if someone has to be in Nevada for at least six weeks to file the divorce, right? And it's a, it's a one-party state. So only one person had to be there to do that. And because women weren't as much as in the workforce at the time, they would be the one to go. They would already make the, all the arrangements back home, wherever they were from, and then one person would come here. But six weeks is still kind of a long time to wait. It would get very expensive if you were staying at a hotel that whole time or something. Right. So what you had were these divorce ranches. And like a lot of, you know, big parks in the valley, you know, originated as divorce ranches of some kind. Stop. Um, Which ones? So Floyd Lamb. Whoa! Um, well, yeah, the one with that the peacocks. has like, with the peacocks one around that was originally a divorce ranch. Lorenzi Park, uh, which is kind of over on Bonanza near um, Springs Preserve, also a divorce ranch. These were largely women in these spaces. Mm hmm. Because, you know, men would usually have to stay home and work and then women would have the free time to be able to go. You know, if they had children, you know, maybe they would go with them, have a nice little vacation. But, you know, I always thought, especially for the time period, advertising a place as a divorce ranch seemed pretty hmm. extreme or unlikely. Mm -hmm. And Angela Moore explained to me that they were just advertised as normal dude ranches, which for hmm. those unfamiliar, a dude ranch is just a place where you can go cosplay as a cowboy for a week. Oh. Um, you know, you can like feed hay to horses and like rope cattle. Um, I don't know if they make you shovel manure. <laughs> Right. Um, but the idea is that like you're getting this is when Las Vegas still had a lot, a lot of that um, Western identity to it. Mm -hmm. And so they would advertise them as, you know, leisure ranches, vacation ranches uh, with a special six week rate. Oh, wink, wink. Which Exactly. There's and also those some of those old hotels on Fremont Street. I took a great tour at the Nevada Preservation Society and they pointed out one sign, a sign for one of the old hotels that was also sort of one of these. It was a divorce hotel. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of, you know, postcards of like women lounging and looking content, I, su I suppose. So women, well, people have been coming here to get a divorce since the 1930s. How long has Las Vegas been known as the wedding capital of the world? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a title that's a little bit up for debate. So officially, the county has recognized it as 70 years uh, okay. because there was a uh, newspaper article that was the first instance of Vegas getting called the wedding capital of the world. And Vegas officially eclipsed Reno as the wedding capital in 1971, I want to say, which is right about the same time that the population shifts from northern Nevada to southern Nevada. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of that has to do with celebrity, a lot of big celebrity mar marriages that happened here. Elvis um, and Priscilla. You know, Elvis and Priscilla. Very recently, Usher, which, you know. Usher, just, Usher, Usher. Yeah. The fact that it looked fun and if you want your Vegas wedding to be traditional, it can be traditional. If you want your Vegas wedding to be extravagant, it can be extravagant. If you want it to just be something very simple, you can do that. 
you know, when I talk to, you know, Lynn Marie Goya, who's the county clerk, it's kind of the fact that a lot of the infrastructure for weddings is here. If mm-hmm. you have family who needs to travel, there's mm-hmm. so many places for them to stay. All, a lot of wedding planners here, a lot of venues, and it can also be your honeymoon. It takes some of the stress out of getting married. So it sounds like weddings and divorces are still an important part of tourism in Vegas. Well, at least weddings are. Divorces really aren't anymore, are they? Uh, Well, yeah, especially not with, as you said earlier, you know, the boy Ronnie Reagan, you know, passing the no-fault divorce. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, Unless we make it, uh, uh, unless we make Vegas a destination for divorces again. But still, mm -hmm. you hear, I mean, I've been to a Vegas wedding. You've done a Vegas wedding. Mm -hmm. Like, is that an important part of our tourism? Absolutely. I think it's it's part of the fun image. I think it's, you know, that sort of libertine lifestyle that, you know, is promoted in Vegas. It's just one of many reasons, um, you know, to come here. And, like, the fact that people get so creative with it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you said you have, like, the Elvis impersonator wedding, which is mm-hmm. a classic. But it's kind of a, a hotbed for, you know, people to come up with inventive ways, you know, to get married different venues, you know, whether it be the Taco Bell (laughs) wedding chapel or something like that. Uh, One of the points I make in the article is that fundamentally marriage is a contract. It's Mm -hmm. a piece of paper. If you want to enter that contract, I think you should be free to do so without any sort of puritanical restrictions or, you know, sense of judgment. And, you know, that's really what Vegas is. It's a place where you can escape judgment, I feel. Um, Yeah. And then I feel in the opposite direction, if you determine that that contract is no longer something you agree (laughs) with, you should be able to get out of it just as easily. And I was actually very shocked at those long waiting periods that other states had and some of them still have. So that's actually something that I wanted to ask you about specifically because as you bring up in your article, marriage has long been gatekept, first by religion and then by the state. And, you know, Nevada tore down a lot of those barriers. Now, in these really conservative times, there's talk of some states actually banning a no-fault divorce. Do you think that Las Vegas will have a critical role to play in the future of marriage and divorce here in America? Yeah, absolutely. I think, as I was just saying, Las Vegas, and I think all of Nevada is a place that really embraces freedom, whatever that means to you. Getting rid of something like no fault divorce would be catastrophic. And that's what I was kind of trying to get at, like when Vegas and Reno, you know, made divorce look fun, or at least something that wasn't the end of the world. I think that's what Mm -hmm. kind of helped normalize it to the point where we could start getting the adoption of no fault divorce. You know, especially because, and this isn't something I quite touched on the article, so I'm glad you asked about it, was the fact that, you know, a lot of this, this all this is happening around the same time as, you know, women's liberation, sexual mm-hmm. liberation. And, you know, obviously when women are trapped in an abusive relationship, it can be a lot harder to get out of it mm-hmm. if it's hard to prove what the circumstances are. Or if you're just generally unhappy in a relationship, that can lead to a slew of other mental health issues. So I think in our our brazenness, we are pioneers. (laughs) Hmm. Uh, Maybe not in the way some people traditionally think of pioneers, but, you know, in pushing the edge, in trying something that the rest of the country perhaps frowned upon, I think that really did give way to people being more accepting. We're already in a an abortion sanctuary state. We're already yeah. the only state where sex work is legal. I don't want us to become also now a, a divorce refuge as well. But maybe that's the role we play. And that's, I think, typically not a space that people think of Nevada in. But we are a place where women are given some freedom to thrive where they haven't been traditionally in other spaces. Absolutely. And, you know, sanctuary is a, <laughs> a, a pretty good term for it. It is an important thing of our culture. And, you know, in terms of gambling, as you said, sex work, you know, all all, all those things. If we didn't have it, I, I think we wouldn't be in Nevada. <laughs> Eric, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you. And that's all.
all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Take care. <laughs>